Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mito Action's monthly expert series. Today, Dr. Robert Navio, Professor of Genetics in the Departments of Medicine, Pediatrics, and Pathology at the University of California, San Diego, will join us to discuss cell danger response, healing, and mitochondrial disease. My name is Stephanie Harry. I'm one of the patient support coordinators at Mito Action and will be your host for today. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on MitoAction's website in the coming days, as well as on our podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature on the bottom menu bar of your screen. If you're calling in via phone, please feel free to submit your questions to us by email at info at mitoaction.org. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. When genetic or environmental conditions threaten normal cell functions, an ancient cellular response is activated that first triggers inflammation, then initiates the cellular defenses and steps needed to repair any injury. This response starts with mitochondria in the cell and is called the cell danger response. New research has shown that acquired hypersensitivity to EATP signaling can cause many secondary symptoms of mitochondrial disease. New medicines are in development that target ATP-related signaling, improve mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation, increase fatigue, pain, decrease fatigue, pain, and the risk of depression, improvements in neurodevelopment, several secondary symptoms of mitochondrial disease, and the core symptoms of complex medical disorders like autism have been found in recent clinical trials. Today, we have the wonderful opportunity to host Dr. Navio as he dives deeper to explain these things to us. Dr. Navio is Professor of Genetics in the Department of Medicines, Pediatrics, and Pathology at the University of California, San Diego, where he directs a core laboratory for metabolomics and exposomics, and he's the founder and co-director of the Mitochondrial and Metabolic Disease Center at UCSD, the co-founder and former president of the Mitochondrial Medicine Society, and the founding associate editor of the journal Mitochondrion. Dr. Navio is the discoverer of the first pol G1 mutations that cause Alpers syndrome. He directed the first FDA-approved clinical trial to study the safety and efficacy of the antiperinic drug suramin and a new treatment for the core symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. His research has recently shown that environmental pollution exerts its effects on human health in part by causing perturbations in the metabolic network, activating cell danger response, derailing mitochondrial dynamics, and interrupting the normal healing cycle. Dr. Navio coined the word cellogenesis to generate focus on the molecular steps used to heal from any stress or injury. Injury. His research has discovered that acquired hypersensitivity to ATP related signaling blocks the process of salogenesis and is found at the root of dozens of complex medical disorders. These results have led to new approaches to treatment that are being tested in randomized clinical trials. Um, Forgive me for all of my mistakes as I'm introducing this, but the content is absolutely amazing. And I'm super excited for everything that you're going to teach us today um, and how you break things down. And I just encourage everyone that's on the call today, if you haven't checked out um, Dr. Navia's website, um, he has so much information on there that is absolutely relatable to our community and is important to understand. Um, we have his web address in his bio on our website, and I'm going to put it in the chat as well. So Make sure that you check it out after the presentation. And um, Dr. Navia, we just thank you so much for joining us today and for, for all that you have to share. So without further ado, I'll let you go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, it's just it's wonderful to have a chance to, to speak to the Mito Action community um, today. And so my talk is, let's see, um, I will go to... Uh, Full display mode, and so so we'll be on the cell danger response, healing, and mitochondrial disease. And you know, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, my website is uh, in blue down at the bottom there. Um, so our lab over the last thirty years really only studies one thing: we study mitochondria um, in in all their biology from conception to old age. But what we have found is that this little organelle is connected to all life on earth and the health and disease state of all life on earth and all the ecosystems. I have three vocabulary words that I'd like to, to, to um, start with. 
Um, the first is salogenesis. This comes from the root word salos, who's the Roman goddess of personal health and well-being. Um, and salogenesis uh, is the multi-step process of healing that's coordinated by mitochondria and ATP signaling. Pluricausal is a term that was first used by Hans Selye, um, the, the, you know, the, um, uh, the, a visionary in um, stress biology who used it to describe um, the chronic symptoms of an illness that could be produced um, by different things, so um, in different people. So, and then purinergic comes from the root word purine, um, uh, which uh, is a class of nucleic acids that, to which ATP belongs. And um, this is used to describe the, the, the cellular signaling, just the way neurotransmitters bind to receptors on, on the cell surface. And um, ATP, when outside the cell, binds to cell receptors that change gene expression. So pathogenesis creates the damage and asks the question, what's the cause of disease? And these answers are needed to, for acute disease care. Salogenesis affects, affects the repairs and, and asks the question, what is the cause of healing? And these answers are needed for chronic disease care. So I'm gonna go through a, um, a series of photos that act as a metaphor for, you know, um, medicine and illness um, to, to help give you a, 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 you know, an overview of what we, what we study. So before illness, the cell and the body are coordinated and, and look, um, you know, like you might imagine this house down at the bottom. When the, the, the house is threatened, when it, a bacterial infection occurs, a, a, a virus or a parasitic infection occurs, um, then um, the, the whole structure of the house is endangered. And what physicians do is they try to identify the cause and then um, provide a treatment that helps put out that fire. And then what's left, what we have is, um, you know, the the damage after um, the, the infection has passed or the cancer has been removed. Um, and that's typically where medicine has stopped. It's where, you know, I, I call this the first book of medicine. Um, and this is where physicians rely on spontaneous healing, which in the past, for the past 5,000 years is, is, has occurred with, with sufficient regularity that we didn't have to Get, drill down into how the how the cell and the body heals itself. Okay, so, but what what is necessary for the rebuilding process is this active, you know, um, the access to new materials and energy. And that's provided by the, our mitochondria that are, you know, provide both energy and the uh, process materials needed for cells to heal in order to generate um, and restore health. So what is adenosine triphosphate, ATP? It's, it's a purine and the prototype for signaling molecule of purinergic signaling. It has the structure that's illustrated over on the right. Um, it is the most expensive chemicals that cells make and is used by all life on earth. It is more universal than any gene on the planet. ATP is used by all living cells on the planet. Inside the cell, intracellular ATP is an energy carrier, a metabolite, and participates in hundreds of chemical reactions. IATP is matter. Outside the cell, extracellular ATP or EATP and its metabolites are signaling molecules that bind to 19 different purinergic receptors. Extracellular ATP is information. So an interesting process happens that, that where, might it, where ATP inside the cell is matter, and when it, when it is released to the outside environment, it seamlessly transitions to information. Okay. In the process of pathogenesis, um, health is um, transitions to um, a disease state um, triggered by any number of different things, from trauma, pollution, genes, tobacco, infections, autoimmunity. 
And the process by which the damage is produced is um, the process of pathogenesis, leading to diseases of acute injury. And that's the that's you know, really what I call the first book of medicine. But in terms of chronic illness, that only gives us 10% of the answers that we need. When cells undergo re repair after the injury, they, they initiate a series of, of transformations of mitochondria that go from, what, what all, well, they, there's a beginning, middle, and end. And mitochondria adopt different um, uh, structures. We call M1, M0, and M2 mitochondria. And they have to move in this direction. There has to be a, a choreographed, a precisely choreographed dance with a beginning, middle, and end in how mitochondria function in order to, to repair the damage and get us back to health. So that's a process of recovery that involves dynamics. It's active and intrinsic and requires mitochondrial energy and resources. Now, it turns out that our exposome, you know, the, the actual sum total of the, this mixture of, of chemicals in our environment, um, our exposures, our, um, uh, and even, even re-injuries that occur, cause cells to, to release extracellular ATP, which then slows down the process so that each step of the healing process can be completed. And once it is, extracellular ATP returns to normal and health is restored. So when the process of, is repeated over and over again without complete healing, it leads to, the, leads to aging. So when disease is healed to, um, and, and recovery occurs through the process of salogenesis, um, uh, we can support that with salogenesis therapies. You might ask, well, why don't we have more of these? Well, it turns out that in science and medicine, it's hard for um, anyone to study a problem that didn't have a name. And this process of, of healing didn't have a formal name until oh, a few years ago. Um, so why don't we have more of these? Well, we haven't been looking systematically for salogenesis therapies. So next is, what is the cell danger response, the CDR? The CDR is a multi-system evolutionary super trait that determines the, the fitness, fitness of all life on the planet and undergoes selection as a unit in the same way that wings and fins are selected from generation to generation. So the CDR is a universal response to environmental threat or injury, and it's triggered by EATP. Healing cannot occur without it. So this is an important concept. It's, the, the cell uses extracellular ATP to sense stress and danger. Once triggered, the healing cycle cannot be completed until the phases of the CDR are completed and the health cycle is restored. And an updated state of readiness or hormesis and allostasis is achieved. So that's adaptation to future stresses. In the same way, you know, regular exercise improves your resilience. Um, uh, we, we mitochondria retain a memory of past stresses that can help the cell respond to future stresses. So the CDR begins with mitochondria in the cell and spreads in a signaling cascade like ripples in a pond um, to neighboring cells, the vagus nerve across anatomical scales, organ systems, and time. The, the, the catch is that the cell danger response is biologically expensive. It is energy and resource consuming. And until it is resolved, athletes and soldiers will underperform and symptoms of chronic illness and disability will persist. Over the past 30 years, I've been studying over 30 different diseases and how their prevalence has been changing over time. And ultimately, as we've looked at these, we find at the heart this increase in cell danger response and ATP signaling. And one of the ones that's increased the most is autism. It's now um, seen in one in 36 children in the US or 2.8% of all children. Childhood cancers have also gone up and actually uh, young cancers, um, uh, including 
a number of different kinds of cancers, colorectal cancer in particular, have been increasing. Now, this has not just, the world changes since the 1980s have not just affected human health. Our, fe our pets are also affected. And, and the incidence of cancer and leukemia, autoimmune disorders, allergies, you know, heart disease, inflammatory bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, bone disease in dogs, you know, and it's now achieved up to 80% of the animals by the time they reach age 10. Autism has increased over 300% over the last 20 years. That's about 16% per year. And that's even after adjusting for changes in diagnostic definitions and awareness where, you, where, where epidemiologists have, have recommended that about... Um, 60% of the increase is associated with you know, medical economic um, uh, factors, but 40% um, is, it, as, um, it is not explained ex and just continues to increase. So chronic disease is increasing, um, even, but the, our health span as, as um, health span has been decreasing with each generation. So it turns out that millennials are sicker than Gen X and baby boomers. Um, that's from, you know, so millennials born in the 90s, the Gen X in the 70s and baby boomers. So I'm, I'm a proud member from the 50s. But in uh, millennials, for example, have over 100% more diabetes. 55% more um, emergency room visits in, for where hypertension is noted and 31% um, and more obesity than, um, than baby boomers. How do we study this scientifically? So in my lab, we use um, metabolomics and exposomics, which is an analysis of, of the chemistry of blood. And we think of a drop of blood that, you um, that might be sampled from a, a finger stick or, or from the arm uh, as a, a drop of water from an ocean ecosystem or a river ecosystem that contains all the nutrients needed for all the life in that ecosystem to, to, to survive, as well as, you know, all of um, the, uh, all of the waste products and, you know, a, a, a and a sample of the chemical exposures from outside the system that we call exposomics. And we take that drop of blood and we put it through a half million dollar machine down here on the blue uh, or you know in the beige over on the right to look at exposomics in order to get a better understanding about you know, the health um, state of the body. Now, classically, biomedical research um, in the West has been conducted um, by experts who build up their reputation by studying, you know, um, individual diseases and ultimately creating um, a, a deep database that that allows them to show how their different diseases are different from all the other diseases that other experts study. Now we took a little bit of a different perspective in that. You know, we started studying primary mitochondrial disorders, but noted some similarities um, uh, with autism. But then we branched out and, and we really started asking this question rather than paying attention to what makes these different diseases different. I asked the question, what is the hidden connection that that is the that might look at the root system underneath all these silos? And so we we conducted clinical trials studies looking at metabolomic signatures in all these different diseases from chronic fatigue syndrome, Gulf War illness, post-traumatic stress disease, Lyme, PANS, PANDAS, this is autoimmune disorders, suicidal ideation and depression, Parkinson, ALS, Alzheimer, and healthy aging and exercise. And by studying all those things, it, it basically led us to this interesting conclusion that it is the things that make the diseases the same that are more important that, for healing than the things that made them different. Okay. And the thing that makes them the same was the failure to complete the healing cycle. 
Okay, so in a way, this leads to a tautology. You know, why are people you know chronically ill? So this is mostly you'll see most of these disorders that I've talked about are complex disorders that are not single gene disorders. So the primary mitochondrial disorders are single gene disorders of either you know mitochondrial DNA or nuclear DNA. But all of the others have there are genetic forms, but they in aggregate are only one to ten percent of, of each individual disease. So ninety to ninety nine percent of these different disorders are multifactorial and polygenic, okay? not cannot be attributed to one single gene. And when that happens, it's really more a problem of adaptation and then recovery that determines whether a person has symptoms um, for a long period of time. Okay, so mitochondria are the universal sentinels of cellular stress. So here are some mitochondria um, over on the left. And here are two cells together with large nuclei, the, 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 the void in the middle. The mitochondria are connected, highly social organelles that are connected in a network in healthy cells. And it turns out that mitochondria need to, to undergo this program sequence of changes, that, you know, this dynamic sequence um, into different forms of mitochondria in order to heal from any infection, even to learn or to... Um, to, to heal from any other injury or trauma. So what happens early on in the process is that when mitochondria, uh, when cells are stressed by injury, um, you know, uh, toxins, infection, uh, one of the first things that they do is the mitochondrial network goes from this well-connected uh, configuration on the left to fragmented. And actually, some cells will even release mitochondrial DNA. This green over on the right here is, uh, is stained for, for DNA. And this is mostly mitochondrial DNA outside the cell of the stressed cell. Now, when healing normally um, occurs normally, health and fitness are restored and the mitochondrial network is, is restored. But when this is blocked, then it leads cells in a repeating cycle of stress and, and, and uh, repair, stress and repair that can lead to chronic illness. And so 60% of adults under 65 have at least one, one chronic illness and 40 to 50% of children in the U.S. by the time they make it to their teens, you know, have at least one chronic illness. The importance of, of so what is the importance of regulatable mitochondrial functions, the dynamics of mitochondria? Well, you can't heal, learn, or fight off infection if your mitochondria can't change. So the a um, a, 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 a conclusion from that is that any cell that has mitochondria that can't change their function is either diseased or dead or soon will be. Okay, so this is an important. So it's the capacity to change that allows us to heal. That's absolutely critical to understand everything else that I, I say in this talk. Over on the left, so these are mitochondrial uh, mitochondria. Um, this is from David Chan's lab at Caltech. Um, mitochondria in uh, fibroblasts, and you can see they're long and filamentous. And and when um, you can watch them actually fuse when they touch other other mitochondria, they will they'll. They'll fuse, and, and some of them will actually um, uh, break off from another strand. And this can be more easily seen on the right with its color, um, that where the mitochondria are colored. We've um, actually bleached uh, two of them to a green color that allows you to see how social they are. When mitochondria reach out, they share their contents with other mitochondria and, and you know turn, turn red in this case. Okay, and here's that the second one also fusing. So extracellular ATP is a key regulator of the cell danger response. And you can think of cells in, in many ways as uh, under stress, the way you can think of a water balloon that has many, many pinholes in it. So uh, when, when the water balloon is stressed, more and more water can, will be released through the pores. Uh, and, and similarly, when a cell is, is stressed, pores in the channels in the cell membrane made up by specific proteins like penexin-1 and, and P2X7, you know, connexins will actually open up to release ATP to the extracellular environment. Now, 
So this is a graded release. This is not just you know the cell breaking open and dying and releasing its contents. This is a that a a, a highly regulated um, opening and closing of channels in response to the cellular stress of, of many many different kinds. And so there, so this allows that because mitochondria are are you know the source of, of most of this ATP and many of the metabolites that are released into through these channels, um, that that the function of mitochondria um, is is used and and information is sent in the form of, of of chemical signals back to the nucleus to change gene expression. We call that the short path retrograde signal, and the nucleus then talks to mitochondria. But then the the cell that is releasing ATP, um, that that the amount of ATP that is released um, is part of what is called a long path retrograde signal that of ATP that binds to cellular receptors that then send signals that change gene expression. So these there are many many of these channels all all over the cell. But when they open too much, then what happens is too much of the intracellular ATP that is necessary for healing and growth and all normal cell function is lost to the environment. We call that a dissipative ATP loss, or another word you can use is purinosis. So purinosis saps the energy of the producing cell and actively blocks oxphos in receiving cells, causing fatigue. I'm gonna get into that more um, later in the talk. So we went looking for drugs that could block the, the release of extracellular ATP. And it turns out suramin is one of those drugs, but there are many others that, that are in development. We call those antipurinergic drugs or APDs. Um, and there are actually even companies that are, that are developing a drugs um, that, that are targeting extracellular ATP uh, release through these PNXN1 channels um, illustrated here. So P PNX3 is just one that's being made by um, PNXN Therapeutics, but there are dozens of others that are being developed. Jeff Bernstock was a visionary um, uh, neuroscientist um, who in the 70s discovered ATP-stimulated purinergic signaling, okay? And, um, and now we know that there are 19 different receptors. These are include ion channels that are called P2X receptors. There are G protein coupled receptors that you know um, work like you know many peptide receptors, for example, oxytocin receptors are G protein coupled receptors. Um, but then uh, P1 adenosine receptors as well. And so the initial thing that he actually published back in 19, you know, the early 1970s was that. The first response of smooth muscle to ATP is relaxation, okay? It's hyperpolarization. And then there's a rebound, um, uh, uh, rebound depolarization. And what we found in, in our studies is that, um, that what people call mitochondrial dysfunction and chronic illness is an apparent dysfunction because we are expecting the mitochondria to have a different function okay than the one that they have when they're trying when the tissue from which they're they're um extracted are uh is sampled and the that tissue is trying to heal so it turns out that that atp produces a normal physiologic suppression of mitochondrial function. So my extracellular ATP actually you know, causes mitochondria to get stuck in different stages of the cell danger response. And Suramin and other drugs that, that act to block this, uh, this, this signaling or, or to, to normalize that signaling um, can help mitochondria um, uh, return to normal health. So a lot of people have difficulty in understanding just the power of ATP as an informational molecule. And to illustrate that, this is a plate full of inflammatory um, cells called microglia that play a you know, profoundly important role in, um, in, in brain inflammation seen in everything um, that can range from you know, from, from chronic fatigue syndrome to autism to uh, Alzheimer's. And if you just put a little drop of ATP with a, a pipette in the center of the dish, 
and then do time-lapse photography, what you find is that ATP is a profoundly chemotropic um, uh, stimulant that causes the microglia to send out their pseudopodia um, because they, they detect it as a stressed cell in the environment, okay? Um, and that actually that response can be blocked by you know specific inhibitors of ATP signaling like ceramin or R, you know a dye called RB2. So in the lab. So so now, now it turns out this is such an ancient response that even plants actually have a, a cell danger response. And over this is in Arabidopsis, a little experimental mustard plant that's been um uh you know, um, modified to, to um, fluoresce whenever calcium in the cells uh, is released. And over on this right-hand side, there's a little cricket bite that you can see. And if you just add ATP to the this, this wound over here, this is what happens. Okay, so within a minute and a half, you know, uh, let's say call it a little over, you know, a little over two minutes, um, the the, the injury over on one side of the plant leaf is communicated to the, 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 the entire rest of the plant. So I'll play that one more time just so you can see that. Okay. So calcium signaling is a final common denominator of cellular activation. Okay, so Mitochondrial dysfunction is also a problem for our astronauts in space. Okay, so mitochondria just they they don't go off duty. Um, you know when you change the, their environment, they're constantly sensing change, and in microgravity and all the other changes that happen on the International Space Station, it turns out that mitochondrial dysfunction represents the central biological challenge to long-term space flight. What do I mean by that? So it acts it's mitochondrial changes associated with a cell danger response act like an invisible fence or an elastic tether that pulls stronger and stronger, ever stronger, the farther you go out from the earth and, and, and with greater time spent in microgravity. By the time people have spent six months or more, um, uh, which is about the time that is, it is that the healing cycle would normally be able to repair damage from most injuries, um, Every single astronaut that spent that amount of time has experienced mild to moderate, sometimes severe multi-system health effects that are traceable to mitochondrial dysfunction and accelerated aging. And if that problem of mitochondrial dysfunction in space is not solved, human exploration of the moon, Mars, and beyond will be curtailed or strictly limited because of these biological limitations. So here's a little an um, illustration to show the difference between statics and dynamics. So if we look at mitochondria, this mitochondrial um, uh, bar over, over on top, in health, our mitochondria have a, a, what we call an anti-inflammatory M2 um, uh, you know, phenotype. With injury, that M2 phenotype is rapidly inhibited and an M1 pro-inflammatory um, phenotype um, is created. Without the M1 phenotype, cells cannot be inflamed. So that's another key. You, you, cells cannot protect themselves by inflammation unless they are the mitochondria convert their, their phenotype from anti-inflammatory to pro-inflammatory. And then, you know, as, as the wound heals, so let's say, let's say this is a, you know, um, a, a, a cut a, on your, on your finger. Um, so initially there, that there's inflammation. Um, then over a few days, cells have to start being um, uh, triggered into cell division. We call that, and that, that requires um, Warburg metabolism that requires M0 mitochondria. And, and that, so, so initially I talked about inflammation, proliferation, and then, then in to return to health, they have to, to reactivate um, differentiation of mitochondria to the M2. I call this M2 star because initially the first return to, to health is a fragile one. And that, that, that the, the cells that, are, that have been just born to replace the cells that are lost in the, the early infection, let's say, have to learn from neighboring cells what genes to turn on and turn off. And that involves remodeling and mitochondrial you know, um, 
tuning in order to achieve optimum health. So what's the healing cycle? So this is just another way of looking at that. So after a trigger, we start with health. After a trigger, um, which involves a pathogenesis process, um, ATP signaling is increased, okay? And the phases of, of salogenesis occur where M1 mitochondria transition to M0 to M2. Ultimately, the cells are able to um, return the extracellular ATP back to normal, which actually tells the, the brainstem um, that the, the danger has passed. And now the, the vagal nerve and, um, and, and many other areas um, in, the, in the brain are able to send signals um, back down um, through the vagus, uh, the vagal efferents, that activate what's called, actually known now as um, the, the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway or CAP, C-A-P. Okay. Bruce McKeown was another visionary who um, studied stress and the adaptation to stress or allostasis, this, this dynamic allocation um, adjustment or adaptation to stress. And he noted that mitochondria keep track of early life stresses. So that means that it turns out that from conception, well, particularly um, uh, from the second trimester until just the third year of life, um, all our tissues are, are learning, not just our brain. And our brain and our liver um, uh, and our microbiome are, are dramatically you know, being shaped and tuned to um, help the growing child uh, you know, adopt optimally to the, the environment into which they're born. Now for, for autism, an interesting um, study was done. I mean, so, so it turns out that, that mitochondrial respiration is increased in most children with autism. And that this is not damage, okay? This is, you know, a reaction to change signals. And so when you look at ATP-linked respiration, oxygen consumption, um, proton leak, uh, maximal respiratory capacity, um, uh, it's all increased. So, and DMNQ is actually a stressor that's being added to the cells that causes them to, to release reactive oxygen and that, that produces a, a stress on mitochondria. And this reserve capacity, what's interesting is again, the, the children with autism, the cells from children with autism start out with a greater reserve, but kind of like a, a, a a, an athlete that is, you know, going to be running a mile, but um, tries to keep up a pace of the 100 yard dash for, you know, after one lap, you know, out of four laps on the on the track, um, they will exhaust and 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 ultimately, um, you know, uh, be passed up by the other other runners. And that's what happens in, in autism where we see reserve capacity actually being exhausted with increasing stress, increasing DMNQ, okay? And so that's what, what we call um, a hypersensitivity or over-responsivity to environmental stimuli in autism, okay? It turns out that we've learned a lot about autism over the last you know 70 years. And, and now epidemiologic studies have shown that there are many, many different ways that autism can be caused, okay? So there are early life stresses, you know, exhaustive uh, next-gen sequencing studies have identified 134 genes, things like fragile, fragile X, you know, um, uh, you know a, a methylation gene called MEX-CP2 that, that involved in, in Angelman syndrome. Um, uh, and, and, uh, 70 hydrocholesterol, et cetera. So, so, um, so, so air pollution and flame retardants and, and, uh, metals and, and, uh, gestational infections are all play a role and, and that no child with autism has, uh, all the known, uh, penultimate causes of, 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 of autism. So there has to be some kind of common common path. So what is the ultimate cause? And um, that that ultimate path we we hypothesize is what we call the cell danger response that's maintained by extracellular ATP signaling. Okay, so we did a clinical trial. 
um, and, and looked at uh, um, the treatment of, of children um, with autism. And this is uh, a little animation that shows the, the drug Sermon that originally had a name called Bayer 205. Um, and it's used in Africa to treat African sleeping sickness, but also as an ATP signaling inhibitor. And we wanted to test that autism was you know, a treatable dysfunction of cells. And so here's a, a neuron um, with nucleus and mitochondria. And these are channels in the membrane and, and receptors and ATP can uh, be released from the, 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 the mem from the cells and bind to those receptors and trigger the cell danger response. So neurons go into to survival mode. That's energy re requiring and, and you know, uh, delays use of that energy for, for normal development. If we use ceramin, we can block the release and block that danger response and neurons can resume normal development. So these are the 10 pioneers. This was a randomized double-blind uh, placebo-controlled study um, where we'd bring the children in. And the ceramin can only be given by intravenous infusion. We provided, you know, we brought the children in with their families. And you know, four of these, these children um, were nonverbal because of severe oral motor dyspraxia. Um, but what we started noticing is half the kids started beginning to talk in sentences, some who had never spoken in sentences before, um, and the other half were showing no change. When we broke the, um, the, the blind, we find that the children who had received sermon had, had improved and those who had received placebo had not. And then we looked at ADOS as a, a measure of severity of autism. Um, what we found was that the uh, you, that that the children um, who had received Suramin had um, dropped their 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 severity scores from um, you know nearly nearly nine um, back down to seven. And by definition, actually seven to ten is what's called the autism spectrum on the ADOS score. And uh, what we found is, is that the, the, the placebo group um, had no significant change. And what we don't know is what will happen after three doses, okay? Could children after a few doses of, of sermon um, uh, in a few months begin to come off spectrum? So what would be the economic impact of that treatment of autism? So if we could, because in the US we spend $268 billion a year, caring for children with autism. If 10% of those children could come off autism spectrum, that would add back $26 billion. And since you know the NIH budget for autism research was 232 million, then just one year of improving the health of 10% of the kids could pay for 100 years of autism research at NIH. So the human impact, priceless. It's important for everybody to understand that extracellular ATP is a normal part of healthy stress. So we did a, a, a study looking at elite athletes are able to run 90 minutes. And we looked at um, cerebral spinal fluid before and after a 90 minute run, including blood before and after and um, an aerobic exercise. And what we found is, is that the you know, one of the strongest signals um, in the cerebral spinal fluid where it's the change in purines of ATP being metabolized to hypoxanthine and reactive oxygen. And that that also in, influenced the amount of dopamine um, that was produced. So that, you know, we typically think of dopamine as an important um, uh, molecule for um, stress adaptation. And, uh, it, and, and in fact, that's tied to the effects of, um, of stress on on cells and the release of ATP um, in the cerebral spinal fluid, in addition to uh, muscles as well. Okay, so the last part of the, this talk is going to be talking about how this, um, how fatty acid oxidation is also affected by extracellular ATP signaling. So we can do a study um, looking you know, using exercise ergometry over on the right, just having a person sit on a, on a bike and exercise um, in a stepped graded way up to exhaustion and, and collect the amount of CO2 produced and measure the amount of oxygen um, that's consumed. And you can actually calculate the amount of uh, 
you know, sugar that is oxidized. So this is CHO is carbohydrate and the amount of fatty acids that are oxidized. And it turns out that with increasing wattage, you know, the, the effort on the, the bicycle, um, we, we keep continue to add oxidize, uh, you know, carbohydrates and to release ATP. But what happens with, as you exercise to exhaustion, eventually fatty acid oxidation is exhausted and that's inhibited by this extracellular ATP that's released. Okay. So um, when fatty acid oxidation is inhibited, you can look at this in different um, you know, health and disease states. So for example, in long COVID patients, they start out with a very low rate of mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation of about 0.2 grams per minute. And then with exercise, rapidly exhaust. Um, and controls, you know, are able to, to, you know, more than, more than double that. Um, and it lead athletes, um, you know, uh, can have, you know, um, uh, you know, achieve over, um, 320 Watts at 50% of fatty acid oxidation capacity and go to almost 400 Watts before they exhaust. So it led to this hypothesis that maybe the performance is related to the resistance or the a capacity of the cells to metabolize extracellular ATP. So that's the work capacity. And in fact, maybe fatigue capacity, if what is causing fatigue is this hypersensitivity to extracellular ATP signaling. So, so I wanna mention on the right that fatty acid oxidation is absolutely required for recovery during the recovery phase after um, uh, after uh, strenuous exercise and healing. And we next asked the question, could antipurinergic drugs like Suramin end up improving the exercise performance and reducing fatigue? And the, of course, the good things come with, with limitations and antipurinergic drugs, you know, if they work this way, could be an performance enhancing drug concern in athletes. When cells are stressed, they release ATP. Circulating cells in the blood have a differential sensitivity to, to, AT, to AT, extracellular ATP as a chemotropic factor. So when mast cells, neutrophils, and bands perceive extracellular ATP, um, they will rapidly um, you know, either leave, well, mast cells, they'll begin to degranulate, um, and, and for neutrophils, they'll leave the, 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 the intracellular compartment, intravascular compartment and move into the, uh, the, the extracellular space. Monocytes and macrophages also have a lower, T cells even lower, and, and natural killer cells have, are most sensitive to just small amounts of, of excess ATP that keeps their, their noses tuned to any, any cell that's under um, stress that might happen because of, for example, a, a, you know, a, the beginnings of cancer. Long COVID patients have T cell and macrophage in, um, uh, infiltration in their muscle. So this is a muscle biopsy. These are these are T cells that are um, surrounding the muscle fibers. Um, these are macrophages that that are surrounding the muscle fibers. You know, being brought in by extracellular ATP release. So how does the cell danger response you know, relate to autoimmunity and the risk? So the, this happens when the risk, uh, when the threshold of the CDR is set too low, when it's too sensitive. So it's when it's hypersensitive to ATP, then macrophages and dendritic cells, T and B cells become hypersensitive and they can tr trigger proliferation that, in that CDR2 phase of B cell clones that make antibodies to self proteins. Now, the, the flip side is, is that it can be too insensitive or too resistant to cell danger response can, can be too, cells can become too insensitive to, to ATP signaling. And when that happens, then natural killer cells and dendritic cells um, are require too much ATP before they'll remove the, the tumor cells. What about the CDR and vagal dysfunction? So one thing that we've learned over time is that you can't fool the brainstem. It always knows when the body is in danger. And Steve Porges' work um, on polyvagal theory helped to identify the connections between 
the the more recent evolutionary innovation of the ventral vagal complex that that sends out prosocial and anti-inflammatory signals compared to the more ancient dorsal vagal complex that that signals withdrawal and hypometabolism in response to danger. So ATP release in cells in the periphery inhibits the response of of to um, cell for signals from the brain that would otherwise signal safety. And to finish with this uh, CDR and what's called the itaconate shunt or itaconic acid is a, a you know it is this structure over on the right that's made from cisaconitate in the Krebs cycle. It's made by inflammatory macrophages M1 might you know, that uh, that have M1 mitochondria. And, and are you know part of the inflammatory CDR1 response. Okay. Um, this has a lot of different effects, uh, and it's being studied right now by Rob Fair and Chris Armstrong um, uh, as a contributing cause of MECFS. I actually like a lot of Dr. Maxwell's work, what's called the in Dr. Maxwell's pentad of dysautonomia, hypermobility. GI dysmotility, mast cell activation syndrome, and autoimmune disease. So that's illustrated over here. And, it, and these these core five things can lead to other kinds of things that are le that that are illustrated uh, surrounding that core. But ultimately, you know, we see at the that the foundation of all of these things is this extracellular ATP release and signaling. So we ask the question: Could ATP signaling cause fatigue in adults with primary mitochondrial disease? And could antipyrinergic drugs like sermon be used to treat fatigue and weakness in adults with primary mitochondrial disease or fatty acid oxidation disorders like the ones listed down here? So now we just finish up. I, I know we're running late, but uh, chronic mitochondrial dysfunction and chronic illness is more about dynamics than damage. That's the just absolute critical concept. It's the capacity that mitochondria retain to change that allows us to heal. The core symptoms of many chronic disorders are regulated in part by ATP signaling and the healing cycle and CDR are energy and resource consuming processes. If they're unresolved, this, the, the energy and resources um, that are needed um, for normal child development get siphoned away by persistent use and the activated cell danger response for cell defense. And antipyrinergic therapies you know, have the potential to unblock the healing cycle, relieve brain inflammation, improve, you know, child developmental progress and facilitate optimum outcomes in autism, chronic fatigue, long, to long COVID, and the fatigue symptoms of uh, adult forms of mitochondrial disorders um, and potentially fatty acid oxidation disorders. Um, clinical trials of serum and other antipyrinergic therapies are, are desperately needed. So I'll, I'll, we'll stop there and take questions. Thanks. Wow. That's all I can say. Wow. I mean, you've had lots of hearts to thrown throughout the presentation. There's just so much to glean from all of this information. Thank you so much for taking the time to share this. And we absolutely have tons of questions coming in. Um, and so we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. I think one of the first questions that, um, you know, you showed that slide that said, you know, this could be a potential therapy for, um, certain conditions. And so I'm just curious, like, where, where is that at right now with the, um, sermon? Like, yeah. what are, what do you see the future of that being? There've been several questions in the chat about that. Right. Right. So, so currently sermon has no approved use in the United States. It's used for, um, uh, treatment of African sleeping sickness, a parasitic disease caused by trypanosomes in Africa. Um, and other, there are other parasites that that um, it's uh, affected effective against um, the um, because it has no use in the in the U.S. Um, all clinical trials have to be done um, using sermon that that is that is um, brought in and approved by the you know the Food and Drug Administration um, and currently that. Uh, our, our work is, has been picked up by um, a company called Pax Medica. And so you should, everybody take a look at Pax Medica's website. Um, they are working hard to make their own sermon. For a hundred years, sermon has been made by Bayer. Um, but, you know, Bayer 
as you know, they're a heart disease and infectious disease company, and they're really not, you know, um, going to be marketing drugs for metabolic disorders or, you know, um, neurodegenerative or neuro, you know, developmental disorders like autism. And they told me that from the beginning, you know, so, so it, it, that, that is something that's been, you know, we've, we've known for all this time and it really has required a, you know, a, a, you know, sermon turns out to be a, a, a big molecule that's hard to synthesize. And um, it's it's taken a lot of uh, very good people um, working in the pharmaceutical chemistry industry to you know to to come up with making new sermon that can be used in the United States um, you know for the new clinical trial. So so Pax Medica is hoping to have um, you know their um, their their sermon approved by the FDA and ready for use for some of the first um, clinical trials this fall. Um, and, uh, you know, there'll be many more, um, you know, clinical trials that will get started in 2025. Wow, that's exciting. That's really, really exciting. Um, is, uh, a patient asked, can you um, share how your work jives with micro galil action theory of Dr. Teo from Tufts? I don't know um, Dr. Teo's work. What is the name of the theory? It's micro, I might be saying this wrong, G-L-I-A-L. Oh, Action microglial. Theory. Yeah, yeah. My, okay, so so microglial. Yeah, okay. So remember, I, I I pointed out that that little plate of green cells that I showed that was, you know, all migrating toward ATP, um, you know, so those those green cells are microglia, Okay that are activated by extracellular ATP. Oh, I mean, that's okay. a beautiful picture too that you shared. Like to me, like that spoke a thousand words of how that whole plant just like lit up. Lit up. Um, and also too, like what you mentioned that you can't, you can't heal, learn or fight off infection if your mitochondria can't change. I mean, I think those are, those are two really important points that you made. Yeah, I, you know, so that's a, you know, just to just to, to you know, I could quickly um, show that again. You know, so um, you know, so remember that ATP is just right there in the middle, and this these are microglia that are being activated by ATP signaling. So there are many other things that are downstream of ATP um, that will um, also activate you know microglia. But if you keep pushing, you know, up the up the road to the very beginning of the process, it's our mitochondria and ATP release that trigger microglia activation. Is tissue hypoxia part of your research at all? Uh, short answer is no. Um, although it, uh, we we um, so so hypoxia and 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 reactive oxygen, uh, you know, production are. Uh, important aspects that occur in spe specific specific um, uh, disease states. Um, you know, so for cancer, it's very well known that that you know hypoxia is occurring at the center of tumors, and this hypoxia inducible factor HIF one alpha is an important part of the shift to um, carbohydrate metabolism away from fatty acid oxidation to, you know, to, you know, glucose, use of glucose for, for you know, um, uh, energy production. But, um, but otherwise we don't study that specifically. Has there been any side effects that have been observed with the use of um, ceramin or other anti- I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, um, so for sermon, you know, the first clinical trials that we have are just, you know, we only use low dose. Um, so um, it's about one twenty fifth, you know, or about 4% of the dose that was used in the nineties when sermon was being tried as a, a chemotherapy agent to try to kill cancer cells. Okay. So um, when, you know, cancer docs, um, started using sermon, they kept on pushing the the dose up because sermon wasn't toxic enough. Okay, you know, and so they kept on pushing it up to the point where you know it would start killing cancer cells. It's still not approved for any cancer indication, um, in part because when you push it up that far, you know, you run into side effects. When you use it at at one twenty fifth that dose, you know, um, uh, in low dose, um, you know, then the only thing that we saw that um, was 
a self-limited rash that 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 was not symptomatic. It, it just you know was a a bit of a flush that the parents could see, but the children could not. Um, well, then not that they didn't see, but they 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 didn't. Uh, it, wasn't, it didn't itch. It was not a, you know, it was not symptomatic and it just went away on its own without any treatment. So that was the, the major thing, you know, and, and, you know, clinical trials will go on to, to, to look at other things. I mean, you know, depending, you really, it's the dose that shows that, that determines the side effects and, and, and ultimately you can't know what a one in a hundred side effect, you know, is going to be unless you treat a hundred people. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Um, what else is outside of that therapy? A patient asks, "What else is needed to heal autism completely?" Or are there other things that are kind that you're that you're thinking um, through in regards to autism? Yeah. I mean, we do. We think that there a multi disciplinary approach right now is you know um, it is a good one for um, many children with autism. So uh, you know that really requires a team of 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 people that are paying attention to, you know, nutrition and metabolism to, you know, put they, you know, they, and it's not just, you know, applied behavioral therapy um, or analysis, but, uh, you know, in, on top of that, there can be um, things that range from, you know, language therapy to, to music therapy to many different things um, in terms of, you know, the nutritional aspect and supplement aspect is just kind of a base. And until we actually have drugs available that, that get at the fundamental, you know, um, uh, difficulty that, that we feel is universal in all children with autism, which is this ATP signaling abnormality, you know, we're really going to be, you know, um, relying on that multidisciplinary um, approach that many parents really are uh, find on their own, you know, um, and, yeah, but you know, stay tuned. I think in the next few years there'll be many other options to add on top of those. How can we? This patient this is an interesting question. How can we identify when it is good to block the cell danger response versus when it's not? Is there a threshold beyond which excess signaling lead to chaos? And then there's a third part to that question too. But I don't know how many questions I should ask at one yeah. time. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, so so. Um, what the important, so what we've learned is, is that the, the only really dangerous time to, to, um, interfere with the cell danger response is during an acute infection. Okay. Okay. So that's where in CDR one, where there's inflammation that's necessary to contain, you know, a bacterial infection or to, you know, lower the viral load, you know, the, the ability for viruses to, to replicate, that's a dangerous time to, to, um, to, to, you know, um, try to, try to regulate the, you know, the cell danger response. Um, uh, in CD, it, there's a lot more flexibility in CDR two and three, um, and um, and ultimately there will be you know it's not just you know there'll be other things that also help um, to support mitochondrial functions because um, it's ultimately that it's the mitochondria that you want to help move in their in, in their 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 functions from away from the you know the this pro-inflammatory phase or from the 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 this you know unregulated proliferation phase you want to get them back to you know to this um this the, this final third stage of the the healing cycle that allows the cells that to then you know tune their gene expression to to you know to um meet the needs of, of uh the tissue um in which the cells are um uh are working so, so I'd say, yeah, so the answer is the, the danger is in CDR1, you know, so that's a, that's a tough time and you'd really need expert, um, you know, advice during that time. And usually it's, you know, in the, uh, you know, with an acute infection, it's often best for the first few days to let nature take its course and only when it starts getting out of control to think about coming in and uh, providing some, um, some assistance. Obviously early, yeah, well, 
and the early classic things of pathogenesis interventions should be done as soon as you know what the problem is. Like if, if you have, you know, if you if you've got a, you know, um, a, you know, a strep throat or you know, um, ear infection, um, you know, just treat that when you have the when you when you know what to treat. Um, it's it's later on that the the decisions get more difficult. And this the third part of our question might be theoretical, um, but maybe you have had the answer. They asked, why does CDR continue to be selected um, if it leads to chronic disease? I think it's like, if if our body, like, why is our body going to self-destruct? Like, um, do yeah. you have thoughts on that? Well, I can say, you know, let's say if, you know, 2% of children born, you know, develop autism, but 98% don't. So the system's working in 98% of the time, you know, and mm -hmm. so, so it's ultimately, you know, the, the genes that get selected, you know, from generation to generation are really working from the majority, not the minority. So it's the minority that, that we're focused on in medicine because, you know, we want to help everyone. Okay. But, but, you know, it's important to note that, that, you know, in, the, any process that you that that has to get selected has to actually benefit the majority in order for those genes to be passed on to the next generation. So, medicine does medicine focuses on the here and now, and you know who needs our help now, and um, yeah, and that 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 kind of biases us, um, you know. So so, and, and there is a deeper answer to that question, but I think it goes more than the time we have for that <laughs> answer. So, you know, you, you've you um, generated this conversation in regards to ATP, and there's all kinds of supplements out there that um, uh, have ATP associated with its name or um, discusses the use of ATP. Do you have any general thoughts in regards to um, ATP, like supplements, like those kind of supplements that you see, see in the market? Yeah, remember, it's the ATP is doing exactly the wrong thing in terms of, you know, so, so ATP is pro-inflammatory. It is a damage associated molecular pattern, a DAMP, a D-A-M-P. So when it gets outside the cell, it actually inhibits mitochondrial function. And, you know, you can, you can, you know, look at some of our, our studies we did a, a, we published a couple of years ago um, uh, in a study with, a, a um, with, with Zuela Zolkipli, um, uh, on what happens when you inject ATP into a mouse. Well, you give them instantaneous fatigue and you cause their mitochondria to, to you know, decrease oxygen consumption by 74%. It is, it, it is profoundly you know, um, uh, inhibitory of energy production, okay? So, and besides that, you can't take it by mouth because it's, you know, it's broken down by stomach acid. You know, so so first you don't want to do that, and and second, if you tried, it's broken down by stomach acid, and you can't raise blood levels of ATP um, just by taking ATP. So that is super helpful. That's super helpful, and I know we're we're past time. Do you have time for a couple more questions? I do. I do. Okay. Um. So there have been since you were talking about um the this uh the serum on um there have been a couple more questions that filtered in. So I just kind of want to make sure that we cover that because you were talking about. Uh, is it Pax Medica that yeah. is going to be? Do you know what the focus of their trials is going to be at this yeah. point? Or right, because every every new startup company has to have a business plan, and their their business plan is you know we have to first become profitable with one one target, okay, and that target they they you know have decided is going to be autism, but yeah. they have so there there are actually patient driven groups right now with for MECFS um, that are driving um, the development of well um, designed rigorous um, double blind placebo controlled clinical trials with Pax Medica sermon for chronic fatigue syndrome next year. So Eileen Ruhoy, um, a, a, a fabulous um, a neurologist um, based out of Seattle um, is, uh, you know, kind of pulling that together. Um, uh, but other, they, you know, we have, if you look at our webpage on, on Suriman, you'll see 30 different disorders that we think that it could be helpful in. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, um, you know, we're, we, we think that, um, you know, once the MECFS, um, 
if MECFS is um, improved, then long COVID will be improved. Um, then, uh, you know, and, and maybe, you know, some profoundly difficult to treat neuroinflammatory disorders um, like ALS might benefit from an antipurinergic drug. Suramin is one that might not be as good for that because it's difficult for it to pass the blood brain barrier. Um, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I think that it's, what my dream is, is that eventually we'll have a renaissance of drug development that, well, where, where, you know, and, and you know, maybe I'll make this, this is a call to all the pharmaceutical chemists out there to, you know, to, to, to look at the development of new, new drugs that, that have receptors, you know, ATP receptors, selectivity, subtype receptivity, um, that can, you know, uh, you know, be matched to the needs of each disease in each person. Um, and, and that's something that we need. Sermon is just the beginning. There, there are actually other drugs that are in development and preclinical trials for like P2X7 um, inhibitors specifically uh, that, that are being developed. Um, but we need, we need a, a, you know, a shelf full of related medications that have been proven to be safe and effective. Um, in order to learn more about this aspect of, of chronic illness. Well, we really, really appreciate you taking the time to, sh to share all that because it, it is, um, it creates hope to see things that are on the horizon, things that, you know, sometimes as patients, you don't always know what's going on behind the scenes or what's going on in the labs or what's on the horizon or that there's, you know, um, things kind of uh, to come. And so, and then it's in this year has been a particularly hard year as we've seen like certain drugs fail, you know, so it's nice to see that there's other things um, and hope for the future of, of other medicines being able to help. Um, on the one hand, I want to end on, on that note because I feel like it's super positive, but there was one question that came in that I just kind of want to give space for, um, which kind of takes us back into a different part of your presentation. But the patient asked, does dysfunctional mitochondria cause muscle loss in adults? Um, and that's a specific question, but I thought it's an important one too. That's, um, our patients face every day. Um, could you, what, so what was that again? I, yes, you know, it was, does dysfunctional mitochondria cause muscle loss in adults? Um, uh, shorting. So, so you're, you're think so, so I'm, I'm, it, I'll go one step more. And I think that people are talking about sarcopenia of aging. Is that, is that possible? What people are, are saying? It could be, but I do know too, sometimes our mito patients have muscle wasting and it doesn't have anything to do with like a uh, sarcopenia or of aging per se, but the, it's, it's like un, unexplained, um, as to why they might have issues with muscle loss. Yeah. So, so it is one, one cause of muscle loss. It is not, um, you know, the only, um, cause of muscle loss. And, and then it, I'm in, in aging, I think that it could be a significant cause of muscle loss. Um, uh, but, you know, there are, you know, for example, there are genetic diseases that, that can cause mu muscle loss. Charcot-Marie Truth is, is, you know, one that comes up. Actually, I'm reminded that I needed to make a correction. I said that uh, MECP2 mutations led to Angelman syndrome. Like, it's actually to Rett syndrome. So I'll make that, you know, that correction for all the people who, you know, um, you know, are, are aware of, of Rett syndrome and, and the importance of it as played in, in autism research. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Novia. I can't, I can't thank you enough. Um, and we just, as a community, just appreciate, again, you taking the time, um, sharing all of your research, your amazing information, and um, continuing to bring hope to our community. So um, thank you. And thank you for everybody that attended today. We will have this posted. I know a lot of information um, was shared today. So don't worry, we'll post it on the website here in the coming week. Um, so you can go back and review it and um, continue to process um, all that was discussed. And we will see you next time. <laughs>